To think of African-American cooking as simply a modern-day version of soul food is to think of a gumbo as simply a soup. Even while under slavery, black cooks created a distinctly American food way, one that blends Southern cooking with European and Native American influences. Their talents earned them the respect of slave owners and employers, and that impact is felt still today. A book by Washington University professor Rafia Zafar examines the historic contributions of black chefs. Recipes for Respect is not a cookbook. Instead, it's an examination of the intersection of African-American culture, history, and food. It notes that she was awarded two medals for best pickles and sauces and best... To Dr. Safar, cookbooks are a form of literature. In them, she finds revelations about African-American history, especially when the author is a former slave. For example, an orientation clause, the sentence that explains a recipe, reveals a lot about a cook's life beyond the kitchen. I concluded to bring forward a book of my knowledge based on an experience of upwards of 35 years in the art of cooking. That's what I love about cookbooks. You have to read between the lines. Although Dr. Safar's book is academic, she is a professor after all, it's peppered with characters who jump off the page. Many of the chefs she writes about were former slaves, like Abby Fisher, whose book, what Mrs. Fisher Knows About Old Southern Cooking was published in 1881. Abby Fisher was from the Deep South, ended up in San Francisco, where she's listed in directories as a, a pickle maker and a caterer. And she became well known for her expertise and deliciousness of the things she made. And she had a group of well-off uh, white San Francisco women who encouraged her to write a cookbook. There's no mention of her background. There's no mention of her race, only that she is someone who, she says in the introduction, that she did not have the benefit of an education. And then there are only three recipes that either glancingly or about as explicitly as you can get refer to a life spent, if not literally in slavery, in a slave society one for uh, blackberry syrup, one for hoe cakes, and one for what she calls infant pat. Take one pint of flour, sift it and tie it up in a clean cloth securely tight. And, and it's actually an incredible thing for a black woman in the South to say. Particularly if it was in slavery, that meant she wasn't separated from her children. If she was a woman of any sort in the 19th century, that she gave birth and raised that many children is also phenomenal because the infant maternal mortality rates in the 19th century were very, very high. So she's kind of bragging. It's a humble brag, but it's a real brag. And there is Melinda Russell, whose 1866 pamphlet of recipes is the earliest known cookbook by an African American. When you read her, her cookbook, she has a slave narrative, you know, the story of her family prefacing her cookbook. I was born in Washington County and raised in Greene County in the eastern part of Tennessee. My mother was a member of one of the first families set free by Mr. Noddy of Virginia. Essentially saying, we were slaves, um, and this is a good cookbook, because even by that point, the idea that there were black people who were in the kitchen and were sophisticated cooks, great cooks, was already starting to take hold of the American consciousness. Former slave Rufus Estes was heralded for his fine cooking, enjoyed by royalty and heads of state on luxury Pullman cars. His cookbook was published in 1911 and includes an entire chapter on sauces. And with instructions that could be lifted from Downton Abbey, Butler Robert Roberts' 1827 book was a guide to proper hospitality in a well-to-do household. When your cloth is perfectly even, then put round your plates, laying four at each side. Then put round your knives and forks, placing your knives at the right hand with the edge of the blade toward the He tells you how to polish silver, certain remedies like for hangover, but also just how to run a household correctly. And of course the irony of this is that African Americans were at the time thought of as dirty and savage and all that. So, 
but it was a black man who wrote this hospitality book that at least one Confederate general had in his library. A hangover remedy would have been particularly helpful after one of Tom Bullock's concoctions. He worked at the St. Louis Country Club as a mixologist in the years before Prohibition. In the foreword to the book, the ideal bartender, Tom's skills with a shaker were lauded by presidential grandfather and great-grandfather, George Herbert Walker. Where does this interest in food intersect with academia? Dr. Safar says food became a fascination in childhood during time spent in her grandmother's Harlem kitchen. She made oxtail. I mean, things, things we now might think of as sort of soul food, right? Fried chicken. She always had greens. The thing I'm kind of interested in in terms of literature is not n only the way a sentence or a story is put together, but the cultural and the historical context. I saw how much what anthropologists call food ways, how much that has to do with the creation of black literature and how black authors specifically use their knowledge of food ways um, to sort of construct a black literary or entrepreneurial uh, civil rights identity. As a cook herself, Dr. Safar experiments with traditional recipes now and then. They're assuming on the part of the person reading the cookbook that you know how to cook and that you can figure it out. When they say a warm oven or a hot oven, they're, you know, they're not giving you 350 or 475. They figure you know. So when I made my gingerbread, my cheap gingerbread from Melinda Russell, which is 1866, she didn't say anything at all about the pan. She didn't say anything about whether it should be a moderate oven, whether it should be a hot oven. The day we were with Dr. Safar, she made hoe cakes from Abby Fisher's book. Hoe cakes are cornbread that slaves cooked on the fields using a garden hoe as a griddle. Stir well and bake on a hot griddle. Today's chefs are adapting African-American cooking to 21st century tastes while remaining true to their heritage. For example, Dr. Safar's favorite traditional recipe is for Hoppin John, but on New Year's Day, she might serve a vegan version, minus the pork. And you're supposed to eat it on good, for good luck on New Year's Day, along with greens. The greens is so you have money, and the Hoppin John, for some reason, is supposed to be good luck. Mm -hmm.